Today, I am very happy to have with me two guests, Helen Bauer and Jerry Fenter, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them. Helen is a hospice and palliative nurse who has also worked as a field nurse, a case manager, a director of nursing, and an independent hospice consultant. Jerry has been a hospice chaplain and currently works as a system director of spiritual counselors for a multi-site hospice agency. And together, they are the creators of the Heart of Hospice, which is a group of projects to educate, encourage, and support anyone who needs information about end-of-life care. And you can find out more about their work at the website theheartofhospice.com. So Jerry and Helen, welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Thank you very much. We're glad to be with you. Yeah, I so enjoyed being on your podcast, uh, well, a, lot, a month or so ago, and uh, discovered that we all share this passion for hospice. So I was excited to continue our conversation and invite you here to the End of, end of Life University. So I'm really glad this worked out. Um, before we get into some of the issues we wanted to discuss, would you just each tell us a little bit about your personal story? Maybe Helen, we'll start with you. Like, How did you get involved in end of life care and hospice in the first place? I think like a lot of hospice professionals, it was one of those stumble in and find out, wow, this is the place I want to be. I had been a stay-at-home mom taking care of my kids, just working a little bit each month and needed a full-time job. And I had a friend that said, hey, we have this great team where I work. We do hospice, you know, come in and give this a try. And, and my thought was nursing is nursing is nursing, right? So I gave it a try and I was blown away just really from day one at the way the team interacted. It was this highly functioning group of people doing this intensely rewarding work. And that was almost 10 years ago. And it's so interesting, isn't it, that even in medicine, until you get involved with hospice, you have no idea what it actually consists of and how gratifying the work is. You can't even imagine it because it, it really is very different than other other areas of medicine. It really is very, I, I think we're very special, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, it is an incredible, it actually is an incredible privilege to be able to work inside hospice. Yes, yes, I totally agree. And then what about your story, Jerry, as a hospice chaplain? How did you end up here? Well, mine was kind of like uh, Helen's. I sort of stumbled into it. I was a pastor for over 30 years. And um, with the, the last church that I had served, I had decided to take a break uh, from full-time ministry and took about a month off, actually. And my wife looked at me after the, the month was over and said, you need a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I began looking around and I had a friend say, you know, you would make a great hospice chaplain. And I said, oh, I will never do that. <laughs> and then about two weeks later, I saw that in the paper and remembered my wife's words about needing a job. And so I applied and they actually called me in for an interview. I went in and interviewed and uh, was later offered the, the position I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is going to be just right up my lane because, you know, I, I know what it's like to be a pastor and be in people's homes and it would be a perfect fit. And I found out it's very different than being a pastor. Being a chaplain is, not like being a pastor at all. There's so many different differences there. And I had to learn how to be a chaplain. Uh, and I took my, my religious background with me, my spirituality with me to the job. But what I learned in hospice was so much deeper. And, uh, and I found my calling. I really did. And i I just love what I get to do in hospice. And of course, people say, oh, you work in hospice. That must be so hard. And I'm like, no, really. I love what I do. I love the opportunities that I have to help people and to serve people and to, to be with them in, in these very, you know, what might be seen as difficult times, but, but in many ways, those times are so, um, so meaningful as well. And I feel like I go home every, every day and say, 
I've made a difference to them. And that is, is wonderful. Oh, I, I love, I just love hearing these stories of how people find their way to hospice and then most of us, many of us fall in love with it and realize, oh wait, this is, this is where I was meant to be all along. And so it's nice to hear that happens for chaplains too, as well as medical professionals. And, and also that you had a learning curve when you started hospice as well, because it's different from what you were used to doing before. Oh, definitely, definitely. And we'll, we'll tell you more about that here in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really curious about how the two of you got connected, how you met up, and what inspired you to start the Heart of Hospice. So well, I, I get to tell this story for okay. sure. Okay, <laughs> So, So Jerry and I used to work together at the same agency. I was a director of nurses, and he was the head of the spiritual counseling team there. And um, we worked together for a few years, um, got to know each other professionally, and one day he said to me, you know, I listen to podcasts. Do you listen to podcasts? And I'm like, you know, sure, sure. And he said, you know, somebody should start a hospice podcast. There aren't really any good, consistent, long running, you know, hospice podcasts out there. And I said, yeah, you know, sure, sure. You're right. Somebody should do that. And a few weeks later, he said, you know, we should have a hospice podcast. And of course, I'm, I'm still, oh, yeah, yeah, that. That sounds great. It's kind of like people say, oh, we should have you over for dinner sometime. Mm -hmm. I never really invite you, and you don't think that they will. Well, he really meant it, and I think he was buttering me up, and a few months later, we, we launched it, and we realized there's such a need for good, consistent hospice information that doesn't have anything to do with the money side or the regulatory side of it. Um, because I have background in compliance and billing and all that sort of thing, but that's not the kind of support we want to offer. And one of the main things that motivated us to start the podcast was we got tired of hearing patients and families say, I wish we had known about this sooner. If we could eradicate the need for people to say that about hospice, that would be so awesome. But that was, I guess that was probably the biggest motivator. Mm -hmm. we, we wanted to make people's experience better. And we thought, how can we make it where people can access it? Well, it has to be free, first of all. And it has to be on demand. And so the podcast fit perfectly into that. So my part of that story. <laughs> Less than truthful part of that story. <laughs> was that when I got into hospice, I had... A learning curve, as you mentioned, and um, no one to teach me. I mean, I had a, a chaplain that I worked with, uh, and he was very, very good. And in fact, I, he still works with me. He's one of the chaplains that uh, that I uh, oversee his work. But he he did a good job of, of helping me. But I felt so lost uh, and not really understanding what to do and how to do this this work and make it meaningful. I began looking and trying to find some resources for, for the work that I would do as a hospice chaplain, and it just wasn't out there. And so one of my motivations to start the Heart of Hospice podcast was to try to provide information and resources and education for hospice professionals who are new to this industry and help them understand the nuances about it. Uh, to just go back to Hospice 101 and to understand the history as well. I think when we understand the history of hospice, uh, we have a, a greater appreciation for what we do today uh, because there's so, many, um, there's so many things that we still do today that were started 50, 60 years ago by Dame Cicely Saunders. And those kind of things are, are helpful, I think, to, for, for new hospice professionals to grasp the, the really deep concept and the, the powerful philosophy that hospice carries with it. Mm. I'm so, so that's one of my, my motivations. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Jerry, because I, I, was, I was reminded that a few years ago I was asked to give a talk about Dame Cicely Saunders. So I did a lot of research about 
her life and how she came to start St. Christopher's Hospice. And it was very inspiring. But And there's something about knowing that there's a rich legacy behind the work that we do and that it was born of great need, but great passion on her part, how hard she worked to make that happen and to create St. Christopher's, um, that it, it gives you a, a sense of pride, but also that this is not like a flash in the pan trend or fad hospice. It's been around and, and there's a deep calling for it. And, 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 and we've all been called to be part of it and to make sure it lasts and that we can keep it going. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, so is your audience primarily, would you say hospice workers? Is that who you reach out to or is it for the public general public as well? When we initially started the podcast, we felt like we were going to to be having a, a dual purpose, and that is to provide education to the general population about hospice so that we could kind of hopefully uh, get rid of some of the myths that people have about hospice. But we also wanted to use it as a way to encourage, support, educate uh, the hospice professionals who are out there. Uh, and so our audience now, I think, typically is made up of primarily hospice professionals, although there is a, a segment of our listenership that, that they're personal caregivers or, um, or just people who are interested in finding out more about hospice. Yeah, it seems to me that your library of episodes could be really helpful for someone who's investigating hospice for a loved one or wondering if it's the right thing to just go back and listen to um, a, a lot of the podcasts that you've created, which they can find right on your on your podcast website. They can find all the archives of right. the episodes right. you've done. On, on our listen page, they can go in and find all the podcasts there. Yeah, we try to to create a balance of even on a podcast on a certain topic um, we'll provide information for unpaid caregivers you know lay people and then also for hospice professionals because i think um, it's good for lay people to see the method behind the madness and it's good for hospice professionals to hear the perspective of the patient the consumer and we really feel very strongly that an informed consumer is going to get better care. And I always found that when I was taking care of a patient and family that were educated about what was going on and they asked me questions, drawing on what I knew or making me need to research certain things, you know, go talk to other uh, team members, that it actually made me a better provider. It drew every skill out that I had. And so we feel like education for both sides and seeing both perspectives for consumers and providers is really important. It's true because, well, there are medical professionals and lay people alike in many cases don't know very much about hospice or sometimes what they know is actually incorrect information. And I, I've run into so many people who have misconceptions about what hospice is and um, so it's so important to be putting this education out there. It, it still surprises me when I find people who know nothing about hospice, including doctors. I'm always shocked there are doctors that don't have any idea what hospice does. And I, it surprises me. I'm surprised that we're at this place still where we, the word hasn't gotten out better than it has. And Jerry, I was wondering, what about in the world of chaplaincy and ministry? Is there kind of a lack of information and knowledge about hospice there too? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I am still <laughs> um, concerned, I'll put it that way, with the number of chaplains who are actually working in hospice who don't really understand how hospice operates and especially how their role in hospice operates. They often see themselves as somehow being, you know, uh, there's, the, there's the nurses, the medical directors, and, and then there's the social workers, and then down here at the bottom, well, there's the chaplains. And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. This is a team approach. You, there's this level playing field here, and you're part of the core team. And I have to keep reminding them about this over and over again. You are a part of the core team. And 
and you you play a, a very important role in this. And so again, going back to hospice history and reminding them of the things that Dame Cicely Saunders said about the role of spiritual care in hospice. I mean, why is it that that still uh, you know the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services tells us that spiritual care is a core part of the the hospice provision that's important and so i try to keep reminding you're important so i also have to keep reminding too about their role and um, the phrase that we use often is stay in your lane stay in your lane you you can't you know begin trying to tell people how to you know the, the, the families and the patients how they they have to do things you just have to learn to stay in your lane and so it's um uh, it can be a, a, a difficult um, subject to try to, to train when it, uh, when it comes to the, the chaplains. Yeah, and you mentioned the team approach, and, and Helen, at least I think for a lot of us medical professionals, we're used to the hierarchy of medicine, especially in a hospital, how the orders flow down from the doctor. And so that's something I found so refreshing about hospice is to just be on a team where everyone has value, including volunteers, you know, including the CNAs, and, um, and being able to just share together and and be free of that hierarchy. And I just was curious about how you felt about that. Oh, I love that. I love that because nurses work so autonomously in hospice. You're out there on your own. And yes, you have your phone. You're going to be connected with the physician very quickly. But if you've got issues with a patient or family that, like Jerry said, are out of your lane, you know, psychosocial issues, yes, nurses receive psych training. We, you know, we have some limited ability to manage that but we are not the, the experts at that area. I love that I can go to a social worker and say, I have an issue with this patient, I think this might be helpful. Or I can go to a chaplain and say, this patient is talking about suicide and guilt and I need you to talk to him about, you know, this is definitely your skill set, and I need that. Um, it's great to know that you can provide holistic care that really is full beyond what a nurse can provide. Yeah, and for a physician as well, uh, how amazing is it to have this team that you work with who can fill in the gaps because there's so so many things that we as physicians have not been trained in and can't offer to patients and to be part of a team where you know someone else is going to go help the patient with that issue and also knowing that we're providing such holistic care to people. We're taking care of the patient and the family in, in every way. It's, it makes it such a gratifying work. And so I'm glad, Jerry, that you emphasize the role of the chaplain on the team, because my concern is, well, I've talked to hospital chaplains who told me they have felt totally ignored by doctors in the hospital if they're not part of, but on the hospice team, it's completely different. In the, in, as a hospital chaplain, they feel oftentimes left out of the, of the goals of care. You know, the, the pandemic has actually made that a little bit worse because, um, Yes, healthcare teams are considered essential workers, but we have had to look on a more granular level at our team members and sort of peel the onion a little bit and only keep the absolute necessity of the services going uh, to have contact with the patient and the family. So right now, as we're, we're recording this in the summer of 2020, a lot of areas are not allowing aides and chaplains and social workers to have contacts with the patients, especially if they live in facilities, or the patients themselves are frightened of having extra team members come in other than the nurse, you know, so they're just using a bare minimum. And so any healthcare professionals that are listening to this, I would remind you that that tacky word, non-essential, that is not a thing for us. Every yeah. team member is essential. Yeah, don't wear that label. Don't take that on. Jerry, how are, how are chaplains handling that in hospice? Are you able to do like Zoom calls or, or teleconferencing with patients and families? Many of my team are actually doing that. They will use telehealth means, whether it's just making a phone call or some of them have the ability to do Zoom calls with patients or family members, uh, which is 
excellent to be able to, to have some, some kind of contact with them. Of course, the patients that are in facilities, many of them are not able to take phone calls. And so we end up having to call the family members and talk to them, which is really a good thing anyway, because the family members don't always have contact with their loved one that's in the facility. And so having us to say, well, I talked to the nurse who went in to, to see you know, your, um, your dad, your mom, uh, and this is what they told us. That can help in some ways. And of course, the nurse is also in contact with the family as well, but we, we're trying to do everything we can to, to utilize the, the available resources, such as Zoom calls or, or even just the telephone to stay in contact with, with the, the families or if possible, the patients. But in, in most cases, it's going to be the family members that we stay in touch with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I like your point, Helen, that everyone is essential in hospice because we are a team and we're interwoven and our services are all, all connected together. Well, um, even before the pandemic, which I know is causing a lot of stress for everyone, everyone in, in all aspects of healthcare right now, but even before the pandemic happened this year, I've had a lot of concerns about hospice in general because I started in hospice a long time ago, back in the 1990s, and um, at a little community-based nonprofit hospice. And things have changed so much over the years, it seems to me. And so I have, I have concerns. I, part of me wants to see hospice go backwards and be like it was in the old days. And I just wanted to ask you, like Helen, what do you see as changes that happen, concerning changes or worrying things um, that you see in the hospice world right now? Yes, I, I worry about the publicity that we get. Seems like every time we make a big mistake, and we do make mistakes, right? Not everybody's hospice experience is touched by an angel, right? But I worry about the perception that, that the media, news reporting, um, the reporting that our, the OIG does, the perception that that creates on the part of the community. You know, we already have misconceptions and myths about the services that we provide. I think that good news that's accurate about us is lacking. Is lacking. And I also can feel concerned about the amount of regulatory oversight that we get. Hospice is changing. They're in the middle of building some, some tools that we will be using. CMS is going to have us use a, a HOPE tool, which is similar to an OASIS, it's an information gathering tool, and all of that's reported in. So I feel like our regulation burden, regulatory burden, administrative burden, is on the verge of growing some, and that concerns me. And, and so that regulatory burden is a, it's challenging for the administration, the administrative staff of the hospice, but it seems that it translates into more of a burden for the care providers too, who have to do more documentation. And that's one thing that I hear from nurses often is that they spend a lot of their day having to fill out forms and do documentation or, or, or enter things online. And they feel it interferes with the time they have available to spend with patients. And I think that's patient's perception sometimes too. And of course the patients only see it that the nurse is having to sit there and document in front of them because that, you know, um, point of care document, documentation is really the best practice. But what a patient or family sees is that you're not paying attention to them. You're not giving them your undivided attention. You're not really hearing what they're saying. You're just gathering information to be able to put down on a piece of paper or enter it into an electronic record. Um, so I think that it's a little bit of a barrier that gets placed in between the care provider and the patient and the family. And it's happening in all areas of medicine, similarly with electronic health records. But for some reason, it seems egregious almost in hospice. It just seems wrong that we go into a patient's home and sit there with our, our computers and have to enter. 
it's different, exactly. I guess, when a patient comes into our clinic and they enter our world where a computer is one of the tools we use in our office. It just seems, I don't know. <laughs> I'm old-fashioned. Seems, it seems, it, I'm the same way. Um, you know, we, we've talked about the telehealth issues that we've had, you know, we've had to employ with the, the pandemic going on, but telehealth can never take the place of touch. And hospice people are all about being present, um, paying attention, providing um, you know, compassion at the bedside, that personal touch. And I think the technology really kind of trips, trips us up. It gets in our way. Um, and then you know, we add all these trappings of modern medicine. And I think that we are having to unlearn how to die. You know, our bodies are naturally created as biological beings, knowing how to shut themselves down. And with everything we know, all the advances in modern medicine, those things are in the way. We, we want to prolong and treat, and we don't know how to simplify and prepare and be open to grief and be ready for a death. So I think in a lot of ways, we're unlearning some bad habits, and I think hospice is challenged by that. Mm. And that what just occurred to me as you were talking about that is when we're working with technology and on computers, we're really activating the left brain. We're staying focused in our, in our left brain where our right brain is the part of us that has all the creativity and ideas and, and passion. And without the right brain, we're really missing a whole aspect of, of, of the way, the art, I guess, the heart, maybe I should say, of hospice in a way, if we, we when we're too focused on the left brain. So how about you, um, Jerry, do you have any, any concerns or do you see issues right now that, that you see as, as somewhat threatening to, to the heart of hospice, let's say? Well, I think that one of the things that I see that still concerns me, and it's probably not going to go away, not for a while at least, is the, uh, the six month uh, rule where a patient has to have a, a, a prognosis of six months or less. So when I first came into hospice 10 years ago, uh, that was the first thing that I was taught is that you know, for a, a person to qualify for hospice, they had to have a prognosis, a doctor's prognosis of uh, a life expectancy of six months or less. I'm like, okay, that makes sense, you know, I, I didn't think much about it. And then the more that I learned and the longer that I was in hospice, the more that I realized there are a lot of people who surpass the six month uh, line. And, and of course, that's okay as long as they still qualify, as long as they are recertified, you know, each time their, their research period is, is ended. They, they can stay on for as long as they as they need to. But there's a lot of people out there who just don't qualify because, and yet they need what hospice can offer, but they don't qualify because they don't have a prognosis. Or maybe they want to continue uh, some aggressive treatments. And I have some great concerns about that. And I'm, I'm hopeful that in the future, our government will say, you know, we can actually provide better care, better quality of care, and we can actually lower our costs by removing that six month window and, and saying, you know, there are, there are other things that could qualify a person for hospice care. And they, the more people can actually receive hospice care and we can, can have a, a, a better opportunity because too many times people still have this this myth this idea in their head that oh uh, you can't go on hospice until you're almost ready to die mm -hmm. and consequently the the time that that most people are on hospice services has been shortened more and more it's a shorter period of time the length of stay has has become a shorter and shorter uh, and, and that's kind of sad to see because we're getting people later and later in the disease trajectory. And that's, I think, not only bad for hospice, I think it's, it's bad for the patients. Right? Because mm -hmm. the sooner they can get hospice, the sooner they can get the care that they need. 
Yeah, I so agree with that because it, it's such a barrier for physicians who might be willing to refer patients, but the but having to to, to determine a six month prognosis is really challenging for some some patients because we don't know for sure. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We can't read the crystal ball. And so some doctors will err on the side of, I'm not going to refer someone until I absolutely know that they're on that final downward trajectory, which for some people might only be two weeks. And they could have been benefiting from hospice care for months before that time. So I agree with you. I would love to see that change. I think it would make a big difference in how many people we can get into hospice and start get receiving care. Yeah, definitely. Are there any things happening in, on the horizon in hospice, Helen, that you see as hopeful or that you feel excited about positive changes taking place? I do, I do. Um, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization has um, awesome, awesome guy at the helm these days, Ido Bannock. And Ido is such an advocate, not just for excellent our excellence in our industry and what we do, but for the model that we have. You know, the team approach, the interdisciplinary team. He is a huge proponent of doing away with the six month prognosis and for other entities, other areas of healthcare adopting um, a similar model to what we have in hospice. Um, I also feel like agencies are getting better at what we do. I know that sounds a little bit, maybe a little bit Pollyanna. <laughs> I think that the fact that we've got the internet, we've got webinars, we've got now virtual conferences, I think there's access to good education and information. The infrastructure for supportive organizations, professional organizations is strong and there's so many ways, easy, accessible ways for professionals to access education and professional improvement. I think that's getting better. I think we're more informed than we used to be. And I think we're also learning to use our voices to talk to our um, state representatives, you know, uh, our congressmen, we're getting better at maybe advocating for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I am hopeful about the role that hospice plays inside healthcare. Mm, that's, that's good to hear. I was thinking maybe the pandemic has really entrenched some of that online learning and connection and communication too, because we haven't had a choice. We can't have right. um, in-person conferences. So we're all doing online learning together. Um, how about you, Jerry? Anything that gives you hope? Any positive changes you see happening? I think the pandemic has really um, shown the kind of creativity and versatility that is, is in the hospice industry. Um, we, all of a sudden, were, were faced with this change in our system. Things that we had done since the beginning of hospice here in, in the United States, all of a sudden got, got changed. And we weren't able to do the same things that we, we always did. And it frightened us at first, and it made some of us feel a little bit um, ostracized even and set apart. And yet what I have found is that it, it made people be more creative in the way that they provided care. And I was, I was very glad to see that. For instance, um, bereavement has always been a part of the hospice care that's provided for the families following the patient's death. And yet during this pandemic, the things that we might normally do to provide bereavement care has been taken away from us. We might do bereavement support groups or we might have a, uh, a service of remembrance or what we call memorial service and invite people to come to one big gathering uh, area. And yet we can't do that now. So there have been hospice agencies who have used you know, the, the 
power of technology to make those things happen and to go ahead and provide bereavement care in a different way, but still providing that care in ways that are meaningful and helpful. And so I am, I'm very um, hopeful in when I see the, the kind of creativity and the desire to continue to be the, the same helpful people that we are and the same, uh, same people who are trying to provide care and we're not gonna let a pandemic get in the way of, of helping people. And isn't that so true? Like we can get kind of stuck in a rut in the way we're offering services or the way we're doing things. But when something like this pandemic happens, it really does, it forces us out of the routine and to start looking for new solutions to problems. I feel like it's, it's healthy for us in so many ways to have to, to have to dig down deep and figure things out and, and do things in a new way. And I'm hopeful that that will that will last when the pandemic is over and we will feel like we've really broadened our, our scope a little bit and our perspective and, and have new possibilities available. Yes. Yes. One thing I wanted to ask, ask both of you about, but Helen, about one thing I hear a lot of, of um, hospice workers talk about is experiencing compassion fatigue and some during um, this time of pandemic are feeling a little overwhelmed and compassion fatigue. And I'm wondering if you have tips that you share for just for self-care and for how to keep going <laughs> and, and keep providing this care, what, what, either for a professional caregiver or the, all the family unpaid caregivers who are taking care of loved ones at home. Absolutely. Um, it's a very isolating time for caregivers, whether you're a professional or a personal caregiver, um, because the work we do going from home to home, you know, we're out in the community. Yes, we're masking, we're wearing gloves, we're washing hands. Um, but still, I think it, it kind of catches you off guard if you're in a grocery store and you see somebody in scrubs. Um, so it's easy to become isolated, and that can be part of the compassion fatigue. And hospice is a hard job on any given day, regardless of whether there's a pandemic. So the biggest piece of advice I could give a hospice professional, regardless of discipline, is don't wait to do your self-care later. Don't wait for the big things. You know, the days of going to get a massage or a manicure, pedicure, take a week-long vacation in the mountains. The pandemic has slowed down almost all of that. It's not practical, it's not sustainable, and for most of us, frankly, it's not affordable to self-care like that. So I would say look for and craft small moments of self-care inside your day. When you wash your hands, take a few minutes and repeat a mantra. Um, at the end of the day, one of the things that I've started doing since the pandemic is when I take a shower at night, you know, for me, it's, it's symbolic. I'm washing away the stressors of the day. And as I do it, I begin to count the blessings of my day. Seems a little bit um, childlike, but it really works for me. And I think like you're saying, left brain versus right brain, it stimulates a different part of my brain just to do a little gratitude practice. Um, I'm washing my hair and I'm grateful that I have hot water and that I have a, a, a towel that I'm gonna be able to dry off with and I'm safe in my own home, and my family is here, that sort of thing. So taking um, a moment to reflect on gratitude and blessings, and a great time to do that is when you're washing your hands, because we do it all the time in hospice. Um, but that would be my, my, I guess my first line, my first piece of advice is to not put off your self-care until you can get the bigger things. Try to do the small things throughout the day, each day. And the second thing I would say is try to be self-aware and to be aware of your team members because it's so easy to become isolated even when you're part of an interdisciplinary team to become separated from them, to internalize the grief that you're experiencing, you know, secondary grief that we experience as providers. And to not allow that support in for yourself. But if you are aware of your team members, and if you're a leader of a team, if you're an administrator or a director, 
to be aware of what your team is going through and provide those small moments of self-care, self whether it's um, a place to sit and have quiet and meditate in the office just for a few minutes or a reflective moment during your interdisciplinary team meeting to recognize the work that's being done you know, since the last meeting. But I think being self-aware and taking advantage of small moments that are affordable and easy to create, I, I think that would be my biggest advice. Mm. I love those tips because I'm thinking a lot of us in healthcare are kind of crisis motivated. You know, we're, we're used to running from one crisis to the next. And mm -hmm. so being in that space, we don't even recognize when we ourselves are approaching a personal crisis, when we're, we're running ourselves into the ground because we're overworking. We can just keep going and keep giving and keep responding and doing what needs to be done. And you're so right. It's so much better instead of waiting for a crisis to happen and falling apart and trying to fix it. If it's a daily practice of caring for yourself, it's so much healthier for, for um, everyone. It's it's not really sustainable in a healthy way to, to put off your self-care until you're in a crisis mode and you have to do something until you become ill. <laughs> do you need a cough? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Um, do you well, have anything one, to add, Jerry? Like, one of the things that I would say is that we often look at self-care as being anything that um, that helps us feel better or comforts us and we need to realize that there's healthy self-care and there's unhealthy self-care and we need to practice the healthy self-care um, and you we know which one's healthy and which one's unhealthy and we often will want to go towards the unhealthy side because it's it's comfortable it's easy it's what i want it's 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 just better um it makes me feel better the healthy self-care can can sometimes uh, be a little more um how do i put this uncomfortable uncomfortable perhaps <laughs> but but healthier in the long run for instance uh, exercise is good healthy self-care and yet most people go, eh, I don't want to do that. But it makes you feel better when it's over with, when you've done it and you, you, you have the endorphins that come from, from being, uh, m moving and having that movement in your, in your life. And so I would just encourage people to always remember to look for the healthy self-care, eat the healthy foods, uh, do the healthy things like exercising, and, and reading and resting and sleep high, good sleep hygiene and all of that and, and to stay away from the unhealthy things that really don't necessarily provide you with the kind of self-care that you want, not on a long-term basis anyway. Mm, such a good point. So many things that feel, feel good in the moment but don't, <laughs> don't benefit you <laughs> in the long run. Um, well, tell me more about um, Heart of Hospice, Helen, and, and what you guys offer. We talked a little bit about the podcast, which I know people can access through the website, theheartofhospice.com. And then are, is the podcast also on like Apple Podcasts? and? Sure, uh, sure. It is. Spotify, Stitcher Spotify. Radio, um, Apple Podcasts. Google, Apple Radio. Apple Radio, Google Play. Um, in addition to our website, um, you can find them on all those different platforms. We have a Facebook group that people can connect with us on. Um, and the website, of course, is a great place to find all our resources and information. We have several uh, pages of resources on the website, including uh, pages for self-care. Uh, since we've been talking about that, there's a, a page for uh, self-care for professionals as well as self-care for personal caregivers. We have a page about advanced care planning. That's been one of our main topics uh, is advanced care planning. And then we have a page just about Hospice 101. If anyone wants to learn more about hospice, then we have a Hospice 101 page where they can read about the history of hospice, about the basics uh, of hospice and things like that. And you've, I know you've covered advanced care planning in some of your podcasts 
interviews as well. That's been one of, um, one of your main topics, along with the basics of hospice and educating people about hospice. So that's really helpful. Anything else, any other um, services that you guys are offering, like um, speaking and education? I know, Helen, you've done um, workshops. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Jerry and I have both been speakers for, for professional um, conferences. And um, on the website, if you go to theheartofhospice.com, you're going to find contact information for both of us, for me and for Jerry, along with our bios. And um, we have done speaking engagements for conferences, and we are available for um, company events, agency events. And of course, we can do it virtually now these days with the pandemic going on. Um, we're also available for hospice consulting. We provide education, consulting services. Um, I do QAPI work, uh, QAPI for hospice agencies, but also various forms of education, that sort of thing, community education, as well as professional education. Oh, so that's interesting. So you work with hospices who might have certain needs or gaps and help them or help them solve their problems, perhaps? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another thing that we do as far as speaking services go is for memorial services for hospice agencies when they are working on those. And of course, I guess it would be virtual at this point, too. But we have provided um, speaking services for those agencies as well. Right. Oh. Any agencies that need some assistance in creating memorial services, we would be happy to work with them on creating uh, those memorial or remembrance services if they need some assistance. Do they, would these be services for the staff to participate in? Um, or Definitely. Yeah, I was going to say, I, that's one of the things that I remember as being the most powerful that we did in my hospice days was at least once a year, but sometimes more often than not, we held just memorial services where we could all come and, and just process the cumulative grief that we all have over patients who have died. And it was so valuable. And I, I see, I saw that as a big self-care practice also, because I, I think Otherwise, it can be difficult for us to process our grief. It may not feel like there's enough time in the day when one patient has died. And yes, we mentioned that at the IDT meeting, and, but there isn't time. We have to move on to the other patients we're caring for and not time to really process that we feel it when a patient dies. We feel the loss and carry that with us sometimes. That's true. And I think with the memorial services that we do as agencies, those are not about our staff members, although the staff members may be invited, those are about our bereaved families, right? It's in recognition of their loved ones that have been in our care. But if you're a staff member and you're thinking, oh, I'll go to this memorial service and it will help me with my secondary grief, you know, it's good for me, it's good self-care for me, it really is not about the staff. The staff ends up connecting with maybe the families that they have served, but they are still providing the support. So I think a remembrance or a memorial service that is for the agency staff is a very, very healthy way to provide self-care and support for them. Hmm. Could you share anything about, about those, like how you might, like what, what, that, what a memorial service for the staff might consist of? Like what? Oh my goodness, that could look like <laughs> so many different things. Absolutely. So one of the things that I challenged my team of chaplains to do was to find creative ways of doing a monthly remembrance service for the team. And I said, we can do it. You know, just about any way that you want to, um, as long as it's within reason. And they came up with some really great ideas. You know, one was to uh, have a, a large jar uh, or bowl that they would put in the middle of the table, like a conference table where the, the IDT team would meet and then would write the name of each patient uh, on a stone and put that stone inside the, the jar. And then at the end of the month, they would pull those stones out, read them one at a time uh, as, as just a part of, the, of a remembrance service time for them, and then have 
the staff, if they had something that they wanted to share, a story they wanted to share about that patient, they could do that, uh, or whatever they'd like to say about the patient. Uh, so they did that. And then there was an, uh, another uh, chaplain who, who really went you know, all out, and he actually set aside a time in a, in a, a very sacred space and lit candles. And then each time that they would, would uh, call out the name of the patient, he would light a candle for them. Yeah, very moving, very moving for the staff. They just thoroughly uh, enjoyed that and got some, a lot of uh, meaningful uh, time with each other. And I think a very bonding time as well when they do those things like that. And so there's so many different ways of making uh, a, a memorial service for the staff very meaningful and very helpful for the team. Mm. We recently um, connected with an agency who has done a virtual memorial service during the pandemic. And they have, um, I guess, a garden, a common courtyard area outside their building. And they set up their sound equipment, um, not anything high tech, you know, I think phones and things like that, and had their bereavement coordinator, head of their chaplains, to sit there and they filmed her and she provided typically what she would have said at a memorial service where everybody was gathered. And so you could offer something like that for your staff if you couldn't all gather them together. Um, and I think that's important because if you work with an inpatient unit, you know, typically we think about community-based hospice being um, furnished inside a patient's residence, but we're also providing inpatient care. And the challenge with inpatient care cumulative grief is sometimes it's just one after the other after the other after the other when it comes to patient deaths. And when Jerry and I worked together, we experienced um, uh, a month like that where the staff was become very run down, very discouraged. The other grief burden had gotten very heavy and it was because these numerous deaths. So to provide an on-demand service like that would capture an opportunity for the day staff and for the night staff to go in and watch this, you know, whenever it was convenient for their schedules. Mm. So you to think outside the box and make it accessible for people. Mm. That's really beautiful. And it, and it occurred to me that right now during the pandemic, every hospital staff probably needs to have um, memorials because many of them are, they're working with far more death than they would have in the pre-pandemic times. They're seeing so many patients die during their shifts and on their watch and no time whatsoever to process that or deal with it. And, and it sounds as if the care they're being asked to provide is really overwhelming to them. And so just thinking of that, it would be really nice if every hospital could use your services and have a, a memorial service for just to help the staff members process everything because I'm sure they're not used to this this burden of grief uh, th those who typically just work on a ward in the hospital or, or and so yeah I think I think you're absolutely right and what we are are seeing I think nationwide is that the model that we have in hospice where we deal with death day in and day out uh, these health, other healthcare providers like hospitals are coming to us and saying, help us. How do you do this? How do you handle this? What can you teach us about you know, understanding you know, cumulative grief like this? We need, we need some help. We, we've never had anything like this happen to us. And so they're coming to us and in the hospice world and saying, help us, please. And maybe that's one of the greatest hopes, hopes for hospice as we get through this pandemic is that, that all of medicine will now be more familiar with hospice and what hospice does also with death and dying in general and grief and, and participating in, in end of life issues. And so who knows what that will bring us down the road. But I'm excited that you two with the Heart of Hospice are there ready and waiting and you're, you know, you're there sharing information, offering support and education. And so whatever comes down the road, you're gonna be there to make the best of it. And, and I'm grateful to you for, for this work you're doing.
Thank you. It's a labor of love. It definitely is. Yeah. <laughs> and we're glad to be able to do it. This actually uh, is going to be the, uh, our fourth year coming up uh, the first of August. So we are, are very happy to have had four years and looking forward to, to many more. Yeah, well, yeah, congratulations on four years then. Um, Thank you. So let's see. So the website is theheartofhospice.com, and it sounds like that's where people can go for everything to find out what you do. But also, if anyone wants to contact you to be speakers or consultants, that they would go through that website as well. They can reach us uh, by sending an email to host at theheartofhospice.com. It goes to both of us, and they'll get a personal response. Um, we love to hear questions, suggestions for content on the podcast. Um, we like to keep up with what people need to know. We, make, we want to make sure that you fulfill the needs that are out there, but also anybody looking for hospice consulting services, speakers, the email is the best way to get in touch uh, hold of us. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, thank you. Thanks so much for joining me. So we got to talk a little more and I got to ask you questions this time. <laughs> and um, I, for one, I'm glad that both of you found your way to hospice and fell in love with it and that you, that you met each other and got this inspiration to create the heart of hospice. So thanks, thanks again for everything you're doing. Thank you, thank Karen. You. We've enjoyed being with you. Yeah. Thanks so much, and we'll stay in touch. We'll connect again, I'm sure. Sounds good. Yes. All right.